the topic for today's service is why are you afraid? Why are you afraid? If you look at your life, when I look at my life, the question you should ask yourself, because this is the question I am asking myself is, why am I afraid? What is it that I am afraid of? Like we sang this morning, the God of the angel armies are on our side. What, is, what are we afraid of? And so we're going to try and, and deal with that and talk about that and, and just really lay it bare today in today's service. So the topic for today's service is, why are you afraid? You see, fear is not a verb. Fear is not an action word. Rather, fear is a reaction. It's a response to other stimuli, sometimes within you, sometimes outside of you. But whatever it is, fear is a response. It's a reaction. Every time you are afraid of something, it is in direct relation. It's in, it is in direct reaction or a response to something else. Generally, people are afraid of, of something. People are afraid. Many people actually, they live their life in fear. And in most cases, you ask yourself, what is it I am afraid of? What is it that is making what that is scaring me? What am I afraid of? And in most cases, you can't even pinpoint it, you can't put your finger on it, but you know you're afraid. Maybe, well, maybe that has never happened to you. You are afraid, but you don't know why you're afraid. Fear is a response, it's a reaction to something else. In order for you to know what you're afraid of, you need to know what you are responding to. The ability to conquer fear, the ability to overcome dread, the ability to live a life that, that is free of fear is as diverse as the regions that people are afraid in, it, in the first place. But you see, your case is different. My case is different because why we are Christians, we are children of God. And as Christians, our lives are buried in Christ. We are hidden in him. We are in him. Therefore, in your life and in my life, there should be no room for fear because we are hidden in Christ. We are buried in him, we are seated with him. We, we carry his name. We are branded by his spirit. Therefore, there should be no fear in your life and in my life. Why? Because Jesus Christ is love. God is love. And the Bible tells us that we, where there is love, no fear. First John chapter 4, verse 17. 1 John 4, 17 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. What does that mean? Because you and I are hidden in Christ, who is love, there's no room for fear. There is no room for fear. There should be no room for fear. There cannot be any room for fear. There is absolutely zero tolerance to fear. In fact, one of the best and the biggest questions that you and I should ask ourselves all the time, every time is, what am I afraid of? What am I afraid of? What is making me fear? What is causing me to lose my sleep and be awake all night when he who watches over me neither sleeps nor slumbers? Why are you afraid this morning? What is causing you to be afraid? What is the source of the fear that you are experiencing this morning? Many people maybe including you and I, many people are stuck in the same way 
in the same pattern, in the same lifestyle that has not yielded any change for the past 15, 20 years. And that's not because they don't want to change. If that's not because they don't want to change. It's not because they don't deserve a change. It's not because they don't have what is required to change. For many of them, the only reason that they have not experienced the change that they want, that they desire, that they, they deserve, is because they are held down by fear. They are, they are, they are suppressed. They are are living a life that is constantly, permanently under fear. The question is, is that you? The question is, is that me? Is that who you are? Is that who I am? Is that how you and I are living our lives today? Even though we profess something else, are we still living under fear? So much so, the fear has crippled and, and held us bound and won't let us go. Why are you afraid? What are you afraid of? Who are you afraid of? So, quickly, let's start to look at the reason why people are afraid. The reason why you are afraid. And as we go through this, you may find yourself somewhere along the line. Thank God. It's the your day has come to be delivered from that, that snare called fear. The first reason people are afraid is because they are ignorant. People are afraid because they are ignorant. Daniel 11, 32 said, those who know their God, they shall be strong and they will do great exploit because they, are, they do not only know who their God is, but they know who they are in him. They know who, what part of him they occupy. They understand that the God of the angel armies is on their side. They recognize that nothing can the, no weapon formed against them will prosper. But if you don't know that, if you are ignorant of that knowledge, of that understanding, so the number one reason people are afraid is, is ignorance. When you are ignorant of who you are, when fear comes, you'll be affected, you'll be shaking, you'll be trembling because you don't know who you are. You see, fear has a crippling power. It has a, a, a handcuff that he puts people in and he bows them up. When you allow fear to dominate your life, it will chain you down. It will tie you down. It will obstruct you. It will delay and derail you. Fear will make you waste, it will make you lose, it will make you hide, it will make you misuse what God has given to you, what God has deposited in you, what God has used, or what God has planned to use to bring you out of obscurity into the limelight. Fear will hold you down from experiencing it. The same thing that God has planted in you and blessed you with to take you out of poverty into wealth, to take you out of sickness into health, to take you out of low debate into the king's palace, fear will hold you down because you are ignorant. I remember the story of David in 2 Samuel in chapter 9. After David has settled down in his, in his kingship, after he settled down in his, in his palace, and then one day he remembered the covenant that he had with his friend, Jonathan, the son of Saul. And David called his servant and he said, is there nobody left of the household of Saul that I can do good to because of my covenant with, 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 with Jonathan? And somebody said, actually, Jonathan has a son. His name was Mephibosheth, and he lived with his 
with a nurse that has been looking after him from childhood, but because of all the calamity and all the shenanigans going on, they ran away and now he lives in a place called Lodibar. So in 2 Samuel chapter 9, from verse 7 to verse 8, David sent for this for Bephibosheth to come. And as soon as he arrived, the first thing David said to him was, do not fear. Do not fear, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake, and will restore to you all the land of Saul, your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. Then Mephibosheth bowed himself and said, what is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I? Can you see how ignorance can kill a person quicker than a bullet. David has just said to him, don't be afraid. And these are my promises to you. These are the goodies I have stored for you. This all belongs to you and I am restoring them to you. From this day, you will eat on my table in this palace. But because Mephibosheth is ignorant of who he is, of what he is, of how he is, because Mephibosheth is ignorant of his identity. All he could think of, all that occupied his mind was fear. And so he referred to himself, not even as a dog, but a dead dog. Before you are too quick to condemn Mephibosheth, what is in your hand right now? What is in my hand right now? What is the gift of God that you carry, that is with you, that God has given to you for a purpose, that God has committed to you for a reason? Because that gift that you have, that gift, that calling, that blessing, that assignment, that grace that God has empowered you with, a day of reckoning is coming. What is that gift? But more than that, what are you doing with it? Because inside of, inside of every of God's gift, there is a hidden multiplication and a hidden increase anointing. But if you are ignorant of it, it will not only die in your hand, it will fail to manifest but to the degree to which you fulfill and apply that gift, to the degree to which your ignorance is nullified by knowledge of the gift of God in your hand, is to the degree that that gift will multiply. But if you live, if you are ignorant, if you are full of fear, the same gift that is supposed to, that is meant to increase you and prosper you, the same will become a yoke around your neck. Ignorance and fear, they are killers of God's gifts in people's lives. My prayer is that that is not your portion this morning. But you see, it is for God to give you the gifts. It is for you to recognize the gift. It's a choice that you make what you do with the gift of God in your life. It's a choice that you make with what you do with the ignorance that is holding you bound from seeing and recognizing the gift of God in your life. It is a choice that you make what comes out of it. In Matthew chapter 25, Matthew 25 from verse 14 to verse 18 is a common, it's a well-known parable of Jesus. He said, for the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country 
who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to one to another one, to each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on his journey. Verse 16. Then he who had received five talents went and traded with them and made another five. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more. But he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid the Lord's money. They were given the same gift. Somewhere and used it, multiplied, increased it, but one went and hid it in the ground. I am assuming here that these three servants live maybe in the same house or in the same village or in the same town or whatever. I am assuming here that these three servants had lived with this master long enough to see his way of life and he trusted them well enough to commit this talent into their hands. So the question is, why did the servant that was given one talent, why, why would he choose to go and hide this talent? Ignorance. Ignorance. Because he said in verse 24, to 25, Matthew 25, 24 to 25. Then he who had received one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid. Oh, Lord. I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. The only reason this man went and hid this talent in the ground was fear. What gift has, has God given to you? What grace has God extended to you? And what are you doing with it? You see, God does not give everything to everyone. But he gave everyone something. Oh, no. God, in his wisdom, does not give everything to everyone, but he gives something to everyone. The question is, what has God given to you? What are you doing with it? Do you even know what God has given to you? Do you know what the purpose is? Are you applying that that gift? Are you extending that grace? Are you digging? Are you are you opening it up to see its multiplication? You know, of all birds that God created, peacock is unique in the way it display the glory, the beauty, the 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 the, the elegance of God. When he spreads his, his, his feathers and you see patterns and, and colors and, and symmetrical aligned, it's just a piece of beauty to behold. But if you look further down and you look at the feet of the people, they are ugly. They are just terrible. With all of his beauty, Peacock can't fly. But look at the eagle. He goes where no other bird goes. He reaches far so high that nothing else can, can compete with him, with it. And even as high as the eagle is, two miles in the air, the eagle can spot a rat crawling under bushes and at one dive grabs it, the rat. What has God given to you? What are you doing with it? How are you using it? You see, one of the reasons, in my opinion, that people are not flocking to church, people are not rushing to God, people are not 
just racing into the presence of God is because when they look at you and when they look at me and they see the gift that God has given to you and I and how we have gone to bury in the name of tradition and religion how we are not using the grace that God has given to us to 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 be a blessing not even to ourselves talk less of to the rest of the world they are asking what's the point whenever you are ignorant of who you are whenever you are ignorant of who you are whenever you are ignorant of what God has given to you the gift and the grace of God that is upon your life and his ability to fulfill that promise in your life, his willingness and his eagerness to see you excel. Whenever you are ignorant of his desire for you to live in prosperity and in health, you will continue to live in fear, even though all that is needed, all that is required of you and I is to just recognize what we have. Get rid of ignorance in your life. Get rid of ignorance in your life and fear will, will disappear. You are afraid of what you don't know. Get knowledge, get understanding, get the wisdom of God. Apply the gift of God that is on, in, that is on your life, that is in your hand, and you will see how quickly fear will disappear from your life. The second reason people are afraid is a lot of people are afraid of their past. People are afraid of their past, of their history, of where they've come from. Have you checked lately? Have you checked lately? Everybody, dead or alive, everybody including you and me. Everybody, dead or alive, we all have history. We all have stories to tell. We all have past experiences that we can share. We all have scars that we can show you from our past. So your past is not, it's not unique. It's not peculiar. It's not, it's not just you alone. No, we all have, we've all been there, done it and got the t-shirt. Even people who are dead, they have history, they have past. That's why people are still talking about that. You cannot be in the present or have a future without your past. It is impossible. You cannot live in the present and be hoping to go into the future without having a past. It's not possible. In fact, there was a time when what you regard right now as your past was your present, was your future, was your hope, was your dream. It goes with you wherever you go. It is with you wherever you are. Yes, your past may have been dramatic and traumatic and unbearable and unthinkable and hard and difficult and on and on and on, but it is still your past. But more than that, it is called the past for a reason. Today you are here. You are here in the present, in the here and now, which means you have come through that past. Why is it still holding you back with fear of what happened in the past when you've already Passed by it when you have already gone through it, when it is it is already behind you. Why is the fear of the past still holding you? If you allow it, if you allow it, the past will, 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 will it will rob you of your today and deny you of your tomorrow. If you allow your past to hold you back with fear, fear of who. Oh, Ooh, ooh. You remember the story of the woman that was caught in adultery and they brought him to the city and they wanted to stone him. And Jesus showed up and he said, let him who have no sin cast the first stone. What was he saying? He let the person who doesn't have the past, let him, let him be the first person to throw this stone. What happened? 
they all started dropping their stones from starting from the oldest to the youngest and walked away. Why? Because they all have stories. Don't let your past become a dread. Don't let your past become a, 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 a yoke around your neck that you carry about. Don't let your past continue to keep you in fear of today and tomorrow. Don't let your past turn you into a pillar of salt. According to Genesis 19.26, when Lot's wife looked back and he, she became a pillar of salt. Why? Because she was looking back into her past. She's allowing the what is already behind her stop her from looking at what is ahead of her. Yes, some people, they knew, they knew you in the past. They have your catalog. They know your history. They can tell you from the day you were born to the day you will die to every day you have lived. They have all those things they can tell you. They can tell you how terrible your history was, how you should not be, be who you are right now, how you are not supposed to be enjoying life right now, how your past, you, people are good at keeping the record. That is their opinion. The question is, what would you do? How would you handle your past? Put your past behind you. Stop it from continuing to threaten your today and, and, and take, take hostage your tomorrow. Look at the life of Apostle Paul. When he was saw, he was known as the terrorist. He was killing people and, and just persecuting the church. And then one day he had an encounter with God and he became Paul. And he was so bold as to say, I've never wronged anybody. What was he saying? Whatever is behind me is behind me. It's not going to continue to dog my life. I choose not to live in fear because of what people will say, because of my, my, my history. No wonder 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 tells us, he said, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Has the old things passed away in your life? Or is it still being used? Are you, are you still under the bondage of the old? Is the past still holding you back and keeping you in fear and trembling and shaking and, and, and sweating? Your past issues. Because when people talk about past like this, you start to think, oh, it's the bad things I've done in the past. No, it doesn't have to be just your bad memories. Some people, they are bad, their past, they have wonderful stories. But just as the bad history is not good for you, so also it's dwelling in the glory of the past is not good either. You've heard people say, oh, the good old days. Well, thank God for the good old days, but that's what they are, old days. They, have, they are far behind you. And the reason most people say that is because they have allowed themselves to be frozen in time. They are locked into that experience and they cannot shake it off and, and, and explore what is ahead of them for the fear of if I let it go, what if I can't see such a thing in future? What if there is no such enjoyment in my future? What if and what if and what if? And so fear holds them into the the set the the the, 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 the good old days. So much so that every new thing that God is doing in their lives and around them, they can't see it. Don't allow the fear of you missing out on the said good old days. Don't let that, don't allow that to stop you from seeing the opportunities that God is putting in front of you, from seeing the blessings that God is bringing into your life today. Take example from the life of Jesus and Apostle Paul. In, in Philippians chapter 3, from verse 7 to verse 8, Philippians chapter 3, from verse 7 to verse 8, he said, But what things were gained to me? This is our support. All those things that were considered gained to me, these I have now counted lost for Christ. 
Yet indeed, I also count all, all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. He, I mean, Apostle Paul, when you look at his credentials, he, he got it all. But when he considered all of that and he compared that to his present and his future, he said, they're all done. What is in your past, past that is haunting you right now, that is making you be, become paralyzed with fear? What is in your past that is stopping you from seeing the goodness and the glory of God in your life and your today and in your tomorrow? Let me tell you, your past is like a check that was already drawn. It is already spent. Your, you, there's nothing you can do. It is that check is gone. Your future is a promise, promissory note. There is no guarantee that you're going to have it or even when you have it, how it's going to be. Your future is a promissory note. But your present, your today, your now, your here and now, no, that is cash in hand. That is physical cash in your back pocket. And that is power. That is resources. That is assurance. That is confidence. That is that is the, the, the ability to do something new. Embrace your today. Don't let your past keep holding you back from going forward and enjoy your present. Remember your past, but don't dwell on it, whether good or bad. Think about your tomorrow, but don't enslave yourself to it. Live for today. Make the best of today. Take advantage of all the opportunities and the grace and the glory and the, the pray that God has put into your present. Embrace it. And as you see that, you see God will multiply you, will increase you, will enlarge you. Fear will have no authority over you. Refuse to fear, especially fear of the past. Walk straight to that enemy corpus, knock it off the grid completely so that you can see your today and enjoy your tomorrow. Number three, why are you afraid? Why are you afraid? Many people are afraid of the fear of man. In fact, I think it's one of the greatest fears of all fear. The fear of man. The fear of man. No wonder Proverbs chapter 29, verse 25. Proverbs 29, verse 25 says, The fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be saved. The fear of man is a prison. Once the door is locked against you, you are in. The fear of man is one of the greatest of fears that anybody can encounter. The fear of what will they say? The fear of how would they react? How would they respond? What would they think about me? How would they judge me? The fear of man is a prison. Is that why you're afraid today? Who is there in your life that is making you live in fear today? The fear of man will forever ensnare you to live in a world that is created by those other people. When you live under the, the, the dread of another man, of another woman, of another person, your life will consist constantly, consistently, permanently be shaped by those people. And guess what? The life they are designing for you is not for your own benefit. In fact, the life they are designing for you, holding you down with fear, that life is not for your blessing. It's for their own advantage and to your detriment. Who is that person in your life that you're afraid of today? 
Some people are afraid of their parents. Some people are afraid of their spouses. Some people are even afraid of their children, of their boss, of their neighbor, of their pastor, of their government. People are afraid of one man or another. And let me tell you, it doesn't mean that you only, people are only afraid of people who have authority over them. No, it's not limited to people who have authority over you. When you live under the fear of man, your life, your purpose, your destiny is in prison. You are locked, locked down, chained down, held down. You remember the story of Saul? When God said to Saul, through prophet Samuel, go and destroy the Amalekites completely, wipe them out, nothing should remain. And Saul went and did his own. And then Samuel came and said, come on, Saul. You know what I told you. You know what God instructed. And Saul said, actually, it's the people. And Samuel answered. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, from verse 22 to verse 23. 1 Samuel 15, 22 to 23. And Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey. To obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And stubbornness is as iniquity and an idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king. Because you have chosen to live under the fear of man, where the people said, where the general said, well, my wife said, this is what my husband said. What about my boss? What about my neighbor? Where my parents are this? Whoever you are living under the dread of, they will make you, they will cause you to disobey God just to obey them. They will make you to disrespect God just to respect them. They will make you to dishonor God just to honor them. And when you do that, the Bible tells us that that is on their part, witchcraft. On your part, stubbornness and idolatry. Who is that person in your life that you're afraid of? Now, everybody has someone or some people in their lives they are afraid of or they look up to or they respect. Hallelujah. The challenge is when that relationship becomes a burden, becomes a stumbling block, becomes a hindrance in your life. When that person is now elevated above God in your life, when that person becomes your God that you are so dreadful of, that you are so afraid of, you will rather obey them than obey God. You will rather listen to them than listen to God. You are in trouble. Remember the story of King Isaiah. Oh, sorry, not King. The story of Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1, he said, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Wow. Now, this King Uzziah became a king and a teenager. And apparently, he reigned for over 50 years. And until he died, Isaiah, in all of his prophetic power, didn't see God. He could not see himself. did not know what his purpose was. Now, there is nothing in the Bible that says Uzziah was, I mean, Isaiah was living in the dread or under the fear of Uzziah. But the question you should ask yourself, which is the question I've asked myself, why does it take the death of King Uzziah for Isaiah, for Isaiah to see the Lord? Why does King Uzziah have to die 
before Isaiah's eyes could be opened, before Isaiah could hear the voice of God, before Isaiah could know that he's, he's ugly and filthy, before Isaiah could even come into the fullness of, 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 his, of his assignment in God. Why does it have to take the death of King Uzziah? Who is in your life that needs to die? Who is in your life that has, they, they have you in a vice and they are tightening that vice? They are squeezing life out of you. They are stopping you from reaching your full potential. They are making you live in perpetual fear and they are crippling you and they, they, they are enslaving you. Who, who are they? Who is he or who is she? Many parents. I'm a parent too. Many parents are holding their children in bondage with fear by controlling them, by putting them under fear. You can't do that. You can't say that. You can't go there. You can't become this. You have to do this. This is. There's a place for training a child. There's a place for guiding a child. There's a place for advising a child. But when it becomes a controlling thing, when the child is, is completely de devoid of all sense of identity, they can only be seen through your eye. That's witchcraft, according to the Bible. Some people are afraid because of peer pressure. Peer pressure from friends, peer pressure from colleagues, peer pressure from siblings. It will cause you to lose focus. It will cause you to do what you're not supposed to do. It will cause you to go where you're not supposed to go. In fact, some people have committed suicide because of peer pressure. Who is in your life that you are so afraid of? Or who are you putting the dread on that they are so afraid of you? Let them go. Set them free. Release them right now so that the, the grace of God upon their lives can come forth and show forth. Let them go. Release them from your prison. You know, many employees have left their, their jobs, their, their place of work, not because they don't like their work, not because they hate the company, not because the salary is bad, simply because they left because the environment is very toxic and unbearable because of difficult colleagues and difficult bosses who want to put them under their thumb and keep them there forever. Let them go. You are not their God. You didn't die for them. You have no control over another human being. Of all the things, of God gave man control and dominion of, over all of his creation, except another human being. Another reason people are afraid is tradition. Matthew chapter 15, verse 6 says, Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. 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 The fear of tradition. The, 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 the tradition will condition you to live in a routine, in, in, a, in a pattern. And for the life of you, you cannot see outside of that perimeter, outside of that fence that has been put around you in the name of tradition and religion. Because everybody eventually become, becomes a product of the world they sit under. But faith and fear comes from the word that you hear day in, day out. And whichever one you are hearing, is the one that, you, that will manifest in your life. If all you hear all the time, every week, every Sunday, if all you hear is that you're a sinner, oh, you are going to hell. Oh, you are not good enough. You are not worthy. God, God's standard is, you can't meet God's standard. You, the, if that is all you hear day in, day out, every week, guess what? Even if Jesus comes down and stands in front of you, you will still not get out of it. Because the tradition, the religious pattern, they have shaped who you are. And the fear is holding you back. That is why a lot of people who profess to be Christians today 
are not, they are just, forgive me, I'm not judging anybody, but most of us that call ourselves Christians today, we are just Christians by name. We are not free, even though Jesus said, I have come that you may be free from the bondage of sin and death and condemnation and the enemy and all of that. But many of us are still living under fear, fear of tradition. Well, in our church, this is what we do. Well, in our congregation, this is how we do. Well, in our village, this is what they say. Well, in our home, this is how we do. Yes, there's a place for decorum, for order, for orderliness and all of that. But when it becomes a yoke, it's a snare. People, number five, people are afraid because they lack faith. You cannot be a Christian. You cannot profess to be a Christian and be under fear. There's a, there's a God's prescribed way for Christians to live, and that is to live by faith, faith in God and in his Christ Jesus. But many of us profess to be Christians, and we, we don't even reckon with faith even though that is the prescribed way that God said we will live our lives. Just because you go to church, just because you serve in church, just because you're a pastor, just because you're a lay reader, just because you are whatever, does not exempt you from the tragedy of living a life of fear because you lack faith. Even the disciples of Jesus, who lived with him, ate with him, dined with him, went everywhere with him, they were still afraid. They still lacked faith. You remember the story of Jesus when he got into the boat with his disciples and he was tired and they went down to sleep and the storm came and they started panicking and shouting and said, Master, I care you not that we die. And Jesus said, Why are you afraid? Why are you afraid? O ye of little faith. Why are you, you afraid? You are afraid because you don't have faith, because your faith is small. Grow your faith. Sit under the word. Let the word of God build you up. You remember the story in Matthew chapter 17 from verse 19 to verse 21, when a man brought his son who was tormented by evil spirit to the disciples of Jesus to heal him. Because Jesus was up on, uh, in, on the mountain praying. And the Bible said they could not heal the poor. And Jesus was like, what is the problem with you? What are you afraid of? Oh, ye of little faith. And the, the, then the disciples came to Jesus and they said, in, in, in Matthew 17 from verse 19 to 21, then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast the devil out? So Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief. For as surely I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there. And if you don't doubt, it will move. And nothing will be impossible for you. It's not that the, the disciples lack the power to heal this boy. The challenge was they lack the faith in the authority that they carry to see the fulfillment of that power working through them. They were afraid of the possibility of what if we pray for this boy and nothing happens. They were afraid of what failure will look like because of their lack of faith. They are afraid that if you don't try, nobody will know that you don't have it. They allowed fear to dominate their faith. They allowed what it will look like to stop them from exercising their authority. They allow what people will say about them to silence the power of God and subdue them into letting the boy continue to suffer under the oppression of the devil rather than for them to lose face and be embarrassed because they lack faith because that prompted them to live in fear. Do you know that that's the same story with many churches today, many Christians today? Oh yes, we sing and dance and we rejoice and shout hallelujah and 
praise his name until when it comes to you to exercise that faith, to walk in that faith. And God said, say, by his spirit, says to you, pray for that person, lay hands on the sick, and you're like, oh, can't do that. What if? He said that, they say, I'll remember him in my prayers tonight. He said, I, why are you afraid? Why are you afraid? The only fear that is allowed in your life and in my life is the fear of God. Not a dread of him, but a reverential fear of God. Because fear, the, the fear of dread has led many people to walk or hide away from God. Hide from facing their actions and consequences. Many people have hidden themselves from their glory, from their grace, from their promotion and their elevation out of fear. The only thing that fear does is it weakens your hand. It turns you against God and ultimately it derails your life and reduces you or limits your effectiveness and robs you of your peace of mind. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but strength based on love and a sound mind. Embrace faith, walk in faith, live a life of faith and peace, and you will enjoy a peaceful life, free from fear, free from burden, free from, from, from dreading. Because wherever the Spirit of God is, there is liberty. What are you afraid of? Why are you afraid? Whatever it is, embrace the perfect gift of God, which is Jesus Christ himself. He said, perfect love cast out fear. Let the presence of God and his son through the Holy Spirit garrison your heart from this hour, from this moment, from today, so that fear will have no authority over you, will have no power over you. You can see the glory of God if only you will come out from under fear. Fear of man, fear of what would they say, fear of the unknown, fear of everything and anything. Fear has torment. But God has a plan for you. And that plan is so good, it's so great, it's so wonderful, it's so perfect. There is nothing better than the plan of God for your life, but you need to get out from under fear in order to embrace it. And that embracing of the plan of God starts with you having a relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ, who loves you so much he died for you, who loves you so much he, re, he, he, he was raised from the dead and is right now sitting at the right hand of God, calling you for, beckoning you to come, telling you there is no fear here, no more fear in his presence, his fullness of joy, and at his right hand, his pleasure forevermore. All fear has been subdued and conquered by Jesus. And once you lock yourself into him, fear has no authority over you. So if that is you today, if you are in this service and you don't know God, or you're watching this program at some point, and you have no relationship, no connection with God, and you are living under fear, today is your day of salvation. Today is your day of deliverance. Today is your day of freedom. Come today. Come to God through his son, Jesus Christ. He said he will wash you clean, white as snow, even your, your sin is as red as blood. He will wash it white as snow. He said, come to me, all of you that are laboring and are heavily burdened by fear, 
by the worries and concerns of this world, by sin, by sickness, by lack, by anything else. Come to me, Jesus said, and I will give you rest. Come to me. He has a great plan for you. Don't hold back. Don't let fear stop you. Don't let anybody stop you. Don't let any other human being stop you from establishing and enjoying a life in God. Come to me. So if that is you, you are ready, you are willing, you want to, 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 to walk across the, 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 the line as it were, to be in, on God's side. All it takes is a, is a simple word of prayer. Simple yet powerful. Simple yet life-changing. Simple yet it settles your, your, your eternity forever. So if that is you, I just ask you to repeat this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I come to you today because I recognize I'm a sinner. I've been enslaved to fear. I have lived my life outside of your will with no reference to your plan for me. But today, all of that stopped. Today, all of that ends. I come to you today and I ask for your forgiveness. Please forgive me. Wash me clean with your precious blood. Deliver me from a life of sin and fear. And I promise from this day, I will follow you. Come into my heart. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. From now on, I yield to nobody but you. I surrender to nothing but you. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for delivering me from sin. I give you all the glory because now I know that I'm born again and my name has been written in the last book of life. To you alone be all the glory. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen, 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 and amen. <laughs>